All right, let me okay, see. here we go. All right. This is episode 441 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point, New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Wally, we uh, have some good news in the governor's race. Uh, they will, uh, the two candidates, I don't know about uh, Karen Bedoni, but Mark Ronchetti and Michelle Lujan Grisham are clearly the two who are likely to win this race. Uh, they are going to face off in not one, but two debates for governor, the first of which is this Friday, September 30th, uh, hosted by KOB Channel 4, and the second debate is being hosted by KOAT TV Channel 7, uh, along with KKOB Radio, and that is uh, <clears throat> October 12th. So uh, I, I think this is very important. I'm glad that there are debates happening. I think uh, all New Mexicans, it's uh, right up there with voting. It's your civic duty to find out what these two candidates stand for. Of course, we've talked about uh, Ron Ketty's plans. They are very specific. They're available on his website. Uh, not so much with Governor Lujan Grisham. She hasn't explained what she plans to do in her second term, if, if given one. So uh, I also look for Ron Ketty to challenge some of the assertions made by Michelle Lujan Grisham throughout her time in office and the campaign. Yeah, this should be a very uh, interesting couple of debates, um, you know, compared to uh, in how long, how easily we forget. So it was Steve Pierce that Michelle Lujan Grisham ran against. And um, um, from what I've seen uh, with Ron Ketty on the stump, I have a feeling he will be uh, even more formidable as a uh, debate opponent. And uh, we'll see what happens in terms of uh, if he's able to make the case and uh, maybe attack some of her policies and how that goes. You know, I, I have a feeling if the governor had her druthers, she would run what I call the uh, Joe Biden campaign. You just stay in your basement and every now and then do a Zoom call. But, you know, the fact that there's going to be two TV debates, I think that's... Uh, I think that's good for New Mexico, and uh, look, I actually uh, tend to not love watching these. I usually uh, watch, read the the transcript or the summaries, but I think I might actually watch this one, Paul. Yeah, and I would encourage you uh, to do so. One is obviously Ron Ketty, years of television training, uh, being a weatherman, that should be helpful to him. The other one, and uh, anytime if you've ever been to a public event with Governor Lujan Grisham, she uh, takes her height or, and lack thereof very seriously. She is clearly insecure about it. And we'll have to see how what her uh, milk crate works out and what that looks like in terms of uh, the lecterns that they debate from. Uh, is that what we're getting at? So. That is. Yeah, it, it's going to be fascinating to see how uh, she responds to that and you know what what the format will be. Uh, will they stand side to side or will there be some effort to uh, make the governor look a little bit uh, a little bit taller? But uh, another aspect of this whole thing that I think is critical is that, you know, I hate to call out our friends in the media, but, you know, I, I only do it when I uh, feel it's justified. Uh, the, the, the media generally let this governor slide on so many issues uh, that I think uh, we're going to talk about a couple of those issues here momentarily in this uh, particular podcast. But I, I, I think the uh, uh, opportunity for Ron Ketty to cut through the filter of the media and really uh, discuss what the governor has and hasn't done and uh, her her authentic track record is a is a unique opportunity. Obviously, it's uh, going to happen twice, but. Uh, this is something that the governor has not faced many hard questions uh, during COVID. Journalists were given one bite at the apple and asked uh, pretty milk toast questions about her approach to the pandemic. And in general, she has not faced direct tough questioning throughout her four years in office. They've been very deferential to her uh, for whatever reason. And uh, I, I think it's time for somebody to 
get in front of her and ask some real hard questions. Yeah, I'm, I like like I say that is a a good thing, and you're right, man. They uh, they were very different, very very differential uh, during the uh, the COVID era. It's like tell us how wonderful you are and all the great things you're doing. It's like it's like okay, uh, you know, if you were a uh, her uh, PR professional, you would blush to ask some of the questions that the media <laughs> would ask during right. those uh, times. So yeah, it'll be interesting. So, uh, and as you said, you know, Ron Ketty, he's used to being in front of the camera. He spent more hours in front of the camera than, you know, a hundred, uh, hundred politicians combined. And uh, I've seen him speak a couple times and man, he's, He's up on the issues. He really is. So I, I think it, it's it's going to be uh, it will be interesting and to see whether uh, he can make up some of the ground that, that the uh, polls and they are just that their polls are not uh, they're not infallible. But if he can make up some uh, ground uh, as we get closer and closer to election day, yeah. Uh, and we've talked uh, about the governor's lack of. Uh, forthcomingness in terms of her agenda for the next four years if she were to be reelected. We've also discussed uh, Ron Ketty's you know, economic and education plans. Uh, the first and best at this point uh, analysis uh, has been done by the Albuquerque Journal. Of course, they do candidate surveys. Uh, you can find out uh, more about the two candidates and their views uh, through these candidate Q and A's. So I want to direct people first and foremost to the Albuquerque journals website, abqjournal.com slash category slash election dash guide. Uh, it, you can find it, you know, through their uh, election guide uh, and go down into it and uh, read through the Q and A's of Lujan Grisham and Ron Kenny. And there you will find the most detailed. It's not, perfect when it comes to the governor's uh, plans moving forward. She kind of uh, tiptoes around some of the questions, but I am in the process of analyzing these at errorsofenchantment.com. So uh, I'll run through a few of them quickly because, uh, again, this is the best insight we've had so far. The governor's campaign website has really been lacking in any detail. So this is part one. Uh First question, what steps should the legislature take to diversify the state's economy and revenue base? Uh, you know, this is something that's an ever-present issue in New Mexico uh, because while Democrats who control the state tend to talk about diversifying the uh, economy, they usually say something along the lines of, oh, we'll generate renewable energy, we'll make that transition, and that'll miraculously make our economy diversified. Well, that's not... Uh, exactly the way things work. Uh, Lujan Grisham says, we must continue diversifying the economy and invest in education to develop New Mexico's workforce. So basically, uh, as we read it, that means we need to keep throwing more money at the education system, which, uh, boy, that is, uh, that is not a plan that is uh, shown to be effective in any way, shape, or form. And uh, it's notable that we have spent and spent more money on education uh, at the K-12 level. Of course, voters are likely going to adopt a pre-K amendment to pour more money into pre-K, universal pre-K. And, uh, you know, we have a very uh, bloated higher education system, and that precedes the uh, governor's free college. So uh, we're certainly already doing that. But, uh, you know, hey... Uh, that's that seems to be uh, more cowbell, I believe, is the uh, <laughs> the, the statement uh, that that we would we would say that the governor's continuing to try. You know, Ron Ketty uh, does have some more details: growing the private sector, revitali revitalizing small businesses through competitive tra tax structure, less regulation, stronger workforce, and uh, we we need to uh, stop making things difficult for small businesses. Uh, so. A lot more details, but uh, what changes, if any, should New Mexico make to its GRT? Uh, the issue that we always love to talk about, and uh, <laughs> the free space on Tipping Point, New Mexico, yeah. bingo is uh, is gross receipts tax, no question. Yeah. And uh, the governor, you know, touts her reduction in the tax rate. Uh, she 
says, you know, that and some other tax reductions that we've implemented. Uh, I think the interesting thing is, as we grow our economy, we should continue to look at ways to save New Mexicans money. So the governor does leave the door open for future tax reductions. Right. But nothing uh, of any substance or detail. And, uh, you know, Ron Ketty has a plan. He talks about reducing the GRT rate uh, and not allowing local governments to raise the GRT without going to the voters. He also talks about uh, layers of GRT uh, that big corporations don't have to pay that small businesses do. So he's clearly talking about pyramiding there. Again, much more detail and uh, and very specific uh, you know, ways that uh, we've approached it. And education. Uh, and again, there's more details in the journal uh, survey. It's the best representation of the candidates comparing their takes on the issues that you'll get before these debates. But uh, education, I, MLG, I increase teacher pay and will focus on early childhood and bilingual education. Okay. Uh, again, more money and we know early childhood is coming. Bilingual education, great. But, uh, you know, Ron Kenny talks about our education systems ranked last. Uh, we need to make up for lost learning as a result of the shutdowns, which disproportionately hurt minority children and address co- chronic absenteeism and l- lost learning. So uh, clearly, in my opinion, uh, whether, you know, and I would like to see that dreaded choice word come out of Ron Ketty's mouth uh, in, in this uh, response, but he's not going to make that the issue in this campaign. Uh, that, is, that is a decision that he is making, but uh, the plans are vastly different in their detail and efficacy. Yeah. And we, you know, we talk a lot and have talked a lot on the podcast is the, uh, New Mexico's, uh, democratic legislature and, uh, the governor, uh, have really focused on the inputs, the spending side of things. We're spending more on this. We're spending more on that and very little on the uh, effectiveness of that in terms of uh, education, crime, whatever. We're spending money, and we're getting very little for it. And I think that that is, uh, you know, that is one of the, uh, that's one of the areas that I think Ron Ketty has an opportunity if he can make the case to the voters of New Mexico. Yeah, and uh, on the issue of, you know, Lujan Grisham's agenda, she's been talking about abortion, and that's been the main thing that occupies her time. She can't get away with that in the journal uh, survey. And there's more to that journal survey. I recommend folks take a look at it directly, but also check at errorsofenchantment.com for not only part one, but part two of analysis on the issues that RGF looks at. There are issues that we are not going to analyze there because uh, it's quite honestly beyond the scope of our expertise, but it's, it's a worthwhile uh, analysis or uh, opportunity for the two candidates to share their views. But uh, I had an opinion piece that ran across the state of New Mexico o- over the weekend. Uh, Lujan Grisham touts abortion. What about the economy and education? Uh, obviously, uh, with so much of the what we face in this state, you know, abortion is way down the list for most people in terms of their top priority issues. Uh, you know, the economy, uh, immigration, health care, uh, crime, all of them uh, supersede uh, the, the abortion issue. And so uh, I asked that question, make a very pointed argument that, you know, when the legislature convenes in January, they're going to have $2.5 billion thereabouts in surplus revenue. Uh, they're going to have still a education system that is performing at the very, very bottom of the nation, and what are we going to do about those? And again, trying to push Lujan Grisham especially, and push her, you know, potential supporters and swing voters to really question what we're doing uh, in terms of 
on, on these these very important issues that are really going to form the basis of governance in New Mexico over the next four years, no matter who gets elected. Yeah, and then you know it is really interesting, Paul, as you as you look at that. Uh, what are the issues that people care about on the uh, four investigates poll? Inflation, the an economy, uh, a national issue, but also uh, a lot of state impact. Crime and public safety is primarily a state issue. You know, the feds, uh, the feds can't do anything to make it better. They can do things maybe to make it worse. Uh, you know, view the uh, consent decree here in Albuquerque. But um, it is uh, immigration and the border is up there. Healthcare, thirty four percent. Both of those seem to be federal issues. But again, uh, uh, with Democrats, will uh, voters draw the uh, connection? And then abortion, way, way, way down at twenty nine percent. And the one that doesn't show up in that uh, I wish would, but it doesn't, is education. So that didn't even make the top five. So uh, it is interesting that. The thing that we spend the most money on in New Mexico and that we're getting the least return on investment is not necessarily uh, something that the voters, at least when uh, asked in this recent poll, what motivates your vote, that's not really high on their priority list. Yeah. So uh, we'll see. Uh, there's, there's always that question in uh, economics, uh, especially, you know, what people tell somebody else yes uh, could be a pollster and we've seen this in recent years where uh, polls tend to not especially when they involve one Donald J Trump but yeah. uh, I think the issue of polling has gotten more challenging in recent years uh, but the uh, the idea that you, you tell people what you think makes you look better uh, to the public versus what you actually believe in and, and that's a, a critical distinction. And same thing with, you know, we talked about a few weeks ago, the governor uh, on her campaign page saying that she's a product of New Mexico's uh, public school system. She knows that the constituency of New Mexico, the unions and the people who she relies on for political support want to make her, you know, one of their own and want to uh, have believe that she is uh, supporting that education system. Of course, she has greatly with financial benefits, but uh, she actually went to a private, you know, Catholic high school. Uh, as per her biography, uh, she just doesn't talk about it. So it, it it's so often just like, you know, with COVID and so many other issues, it's not what is actually true that matters. It is how you portray yourself that, affects how especially some of these core constituencies view you. And, you know, you could be uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, out partying at the French Laundry while you've got every other Californian locked down. And you'll get criticism from the conservative side and even some of the media outlets, but uh, there will be plenty of people on your side of the aisle willing to support you, even though you're blatantly a hypocrite. And it's uh, it's really astonishing how, how uh, that kind of issue uh, manifests itself and how it's so, it, it, these people don't get impacted by it, uh, the polit political classes. Yeah, it reminds me of, the, of, a, of a, an ongoing Saturday Night Live skit called Common Knowledge. It's kind of a Jeopardy-style game, but it's based on what people think, which is oh. definitely wrong. It's, you know... Uh, what year did the United States uh, become uh, become a country? You know, 1805. That's correct. You know, it's like what people think. So, uh, yeah, we have our, our, our media and uh, it has gotten, uh, well, I never, you know, I think it's always had a, a partisan uh, overtone to it, but man, it was kept under wraps. And now, uh, depending on which media outlet it is, they are uh, definitely never going to ask uh, hard questions of their side of the aisle. And we, we see that in, in New Mexico as well. It used to be that maybe the national media had that more and the uh, local media was a little more hard-nosed. But it seemed, I, I think it's, they're following, uh, they're following the lead from their Washington uh, media brethren. Yeah, it's... Uh hard to say anything else but that that harsh reality and uh, again you know organizations like the Rio Grande Foundation continue to serve up these issues that 
all you have to do is flip the party labels and you would get media outlets jumping all over themselves to do a story on them. And look no further than this next issue. Another uh, blatant lie or at best a uh, misrepresentation of of the issues with regard to uh, COVID performance. And uh, you know, Arizona, the governor says, Michelle led one of the most effective COVID-19 responses in the country, defying New Mexico's odds and leading to lower case numbers and fewer deaths than neighboring states like Arizona and Texas. Yes, we beat Arizona. We had fewer deaths as a percentage of our population, but uh, Texas was the 29th most uh, in terms of uh, COVID deaths per capita. New Mexico was fifth. Arizona was second. How do you put New Mexico out there as an outperforming state when it comes to COVID-19? Again, the media should be asking this question. Is, are they, is she simply using people's ignorance of population size relative, uh, you know, to these other states to, uh, to make her case? Uh, it, it really, uh, I, I can't believe that that isn't a story that the media would would not be interested in if it was the opposite, if it was party flipped. Yeah, because, uh, you know, let's face it, uh, Texas has a, a roughly 14 times larger population above 28 million in their state compared to around two in New Mexico. And so if uh, New Mexico didn't have lower COVID deaths than Texas, something would really be wrong. Right. But in terms of uh, when you quote a statistic like that, you should say per capita or per thousand or whatever, and they didn't do that, which leads it wide, wide open to what the heck do they really mean there? Yeah. And uh, you know, now we get to our, probably right outside of the gross receipts tax, at least in the last few years, the most... Uh, I think uh, talked about issue on this uh, on this program is the uh, Energy Transition Act and the fact that uh, we are facing uh, it, soon we are on a fast track to not having enough electricity to keep the lights on uh, and keep our way of life going here in New Mexico uh, as of this coming summer and. Uh, there's more hearings this week at the PRC, or were more hearings this week at the PRC. Oh, well, yeah, PRC. last Thursday, and I actually watched that online, Paul. Uh, uh, not live, but I did watch the, uh, I did watch the video, and it was like, uh, it was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's this is going to take a while because we have a lot to unpack here. We've talked about this issue a lot, as I said, but. Uh, you have numerous reports on the issue. And first and foremost, uh, again, the media do not explicitly draw the line between what they expect in terms of energy shortages next summer or could have happened this summer if they had allowed the shuttering of the San Juan Generating Station to proceed as planned at the end of June. Uh, they don't draw the line between the Energy Transition Act and that. Uh, it's just mind-blowing because all of this is directly the result of the energy transition act yeah the energy transition act is might as well be gravity uh, yeah. in these news reports it's just something that exists that there's no controversy about that there's no other way that it could be so yeah uh this was a bill uh and just to be completely candid here uh it was sponsored by senator jacob candelaria uh quite a colorful figure in and of himself uh at the time, the Rio Grande Foundation was the only uh, mainstream, if you will, uh, organization on either side of the aisle to oppose it. Uh, we were joined by what I call the lunatic fringe of the left-wing environmental movement in New Mexico, the new energy economy. It's not to say they don't do some good work on some issues. They are, you know, it's almost one of those uh, how... How circular does that political spectrum become with new energy economy? Uh, they are very far to the left, and they opposed it because they want to see P&M dead and buried. They want to see the whole electricity system managed by essentially rooftop solar in your own uh, backyard or something. Yeah, new energy economy, they're an environmental group, and all things being equal, they are for wind, solar, and battery like all the other environmental groups. But you're exactly right. If it 
if it doesn't, if it hurting P and M is more important to them <laughs> than any other issue by uh, what the policies they've advocated for many years. Yeah, and uh, Rio Grande Foundation was joined in 2019 by folks from the Four Corners who had an obvious economic interest in keeping the San Juan generating station open and keeping you know that that, that power plant going, the jobs, the tax revenues, all those kinds of things. And uh, when it, just to remind people, in 2019, when uh, the Four Corners, uh, Farmington especially, had been losing population, natural gas prices had been really pummeled, uh, that, that area had been beaten up and beaten up bad. And the shuttering of this power plant at one point, it was seen kind of as a death knell for the four corners of, as long as natural gas prices remained as low as they had. And for a variety of reasons, uh, the four corners had seen it, its economic fortunes revitalized, uh, partially due to the higher gas prices, natural gas prices. But in, in general, uh, yeah, so it was New Energy Economy, Rio Grande Foundation, and, uh, and, and the four corners groups. Now, we are four days, uh, actually three days. I'm sorry, I wrote this post yesterday. We are three days from the likely permanent shuttering of the San Juan Generating Station. That is September the 30th. That is uh, a three-month delay from when it was originally meant to shut down at the end of June. At that point, P&M loses 26% of its baseload electricity and uh, will lose another 5% when the utility exits its Palo Verde nuclear plant lease in 2023. Now, I don't know exactly what the date is of that right. lease ending, but uh, if it's before summer, uh, that's going to cause further issues. And uh, I, I, again, it, it's just incredible to me that A, the media has not pinned the blame on the 2019 Energy Transition Act, and that you know we hear these stories bubble up but the governor has faced very, very few real questions directly to her on what is expected to happen, where we're going to get electricity. And I, again, hope, circling back, as Jen Psaki would say, to <laughs> our debate uh, statement at the beginning of this, I sincerely hope this is an issue that is discussed uh, at, at length in the debate. And it's, it is just sad that you can't have you can't have policymakers ask these questions by news outlets in a regular uh, media cycle. Instead, you have to wait for a political debate just a few weeks before an election. This the the fact that Governor Lujan Grisham is not called on the carpet by the media every single time you have these meetings. Yes, the PRC plays a role, but the PRC is going away, folks, in the current form. Uh, it, it's truly the governor and certain members of the legislature, primarily Democrats, some Republicans who supported that Energy Transition Act, and they are getting off scot-free. Yeah, and then, Paul, I'll even go one further than that, is until there's the big blackout, no one pays much attention. You know, the call, uh, Texas had a lot of structural issues with their uh, market, but until the lights go out for two, three days, nobody cares. You know, uh, P&M basically extended the operations for three months from their original plan for San Juan Generating Station. And uh, from all I can tell is they made a good call. If they wouldn't have done that, the lights would have... Uh, uh, likely gone out here in New Mexico uh, early early in the summer when the we, you know we had record heat waves. But it, um, a couple of things, if you look at you know the the uh, PRC hearing that happened this last week, a lot of the utilities are, are going to rely on purchases, uh, open market purchases, uh, cross state lines, intrastate. But what's uh, uh, Wally? How do you purchase something that doesn't exist? That. My friend is the issue. Yes, is that, you know, years ago there was uh, every utility had about what, you know, throw a number out there on average, uh, say 20% excess uh, power. And so if uh, you ran into trouble for a short period of time, you could certainly buy it from another utility. Well, we're shutting down coal plants quicker than we're adding uh, wind, solar, and batteries. And wind, solar, and batteries are only uh, of limited use. And then, uh, 
You know what, Paul, in New Mexico, when PM presented their plan to get out of Palo Verde and uh, to get um, out of San Juan Generating Station, their initial integrated resource plan had them uh, building natural gas facilities right away. And then the commission said, well, I thought this was uh, designed to get away from fossil fuels. And they're like, yeah, you're right. We won't build those. Uh, well, then uh, comes a, uh, a uh, merger uh, proposal from Avangrid and PNM, and I think that maybe that was PNM's plan to get out of this. And if you read the, uh, the financial press, uh, they're still betting that that merger <coughs> will happen sometime in 2023 when a new uh, appointed commission is there. And so what will that do? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm sounding like a, a soap opera cliffhanger. You know, will there be power in 2023? Will PNM and Avergrid merge and will they have enough power to keep the lights on in New Mexico? And what will happen to the rates as they add more and more new resources uh, that include not only wind, solar and batteries, but the uh, natural gas or, or something else to back them off uh, when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? You know, and we're facing a lot of problems. And, you know, lest we uh, think that, oh, uh, this is just a New Mexico issue, you know, California, who we uh, seem to be modeling our electric policy after, is already, they continue to be, you know, very bad on reliability. They're in a, a world of hurt. And, Paul, uh, California has gone ahead and said that natural gas counts as renewables. Yeah. So a I, lot going on there. I was going there. to reference California. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I you know, use Yahoo as a regular kind of hub for my uh, web traffic. And uh, a, a little box, you know, they have their stories presented. Uh, there was one. It said how California is starting to look like a third world nation. Wow. And I uh, couldn't help but click on that because you know, it's kind of like... <laughs> That's clickbait. It's kind of uh. like opening one of those really big presents at Christmas time. You, you, you just know that it's going to be something good because uh, you know, whether it's uh, you know, any manner of uh, California missteps on public policy, uh, you know that it's something that is going to reference New Mexico in some way, shape, or form. And this is a New York Times uh, article. The headline from the New York Times is not nearly as exciting as the Yahoo uh, story, but it says, Dodging blackouts, California faces new questions on its power supply. It's from the Sunday uh, New York Times. And I'll just read a few quick sentences. California finds itself on edge more than ever with a lingering fear, the threat of rolling blackouts for years to come. Despite adding new power plants, building huge battery storage systems, and restarting some shuttered fossil fuel generators over the last couple of years, California relies heavily on energy from other states, the cavalry rushing over a distant hill. Sometimes the support does not show up when expected or at all. That was the case this month when millions of residents got cell phone alerts urging them to cut their energy use as the state teetered close to blackouts in blazing heat. So uh, it's a long article and, you know, it is the New York Times, so it's uh, certainly not a perfect representation of maybe what the Rio Grande Foundation views uh, as the issues uh, in this particular area. But yeah, California is... Uh, you know, we have wind farms and solar uh, panels going up in New Mexico to help feed California's energy needs. Right. Uh, just because you see a, a wind farm going up down the road or out in southeastern New Mexico doesn't mean that's going to help New Mexico. And uh, with California, with New Mexico, with so many of these states making this ill-advised energy transition, uh, there is no excess power uh, Calvary over the hill. I do like that yep. that uh, reference. So, uh, it again, it, it is nothing short of journalistic malpractice that the New Mexico media have not uh, talked about this in some detail uh, here in more detail. Given especially the uh, the shift the governor wants to make to electric vehicles and electrification more broadly, but uh, yeah, it's something that. You can listen to this podcast, make your decisions accordingly, and know that you are ahead of the curve. Yeah, and uh, you know, the uh, Wally Drangmeister uh, personally owned backup generation, 
generation index uh, from zero to 100 is uh, it's growing. You know, uh, by this next summer, I think it might reach 100, which means that's when I would uh, look at getting a, a backup generator uh, unless PM uh, pulls a rabbit out of a hat somehow in terms of uh, getting more power this next uh, this next coming summer. You got it. Well, that is where we'll leave things. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointsnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to this show at Apple, Stitcher, or have your Google Home play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.